Everyone, three questions with Morgan Michael. There we go. Said it. I practice. All right. Hey, so I am really pumped to have Morgan and Michael, and I, I, I apologize, and we had this conversation before because there's like that e at the end of your name, and I was like, is it Morgan? Morgan? <laughs> like, how do you say it? So I made you say it, and well, I'm going to ask you about this too because you said there's a little story behind, you know, your name. There but, is. There uh, is. We're going to do like a special three questions because Morgan has a. Uh, brand new book out. It is called A Blueprint for Belonging. And we're going to talk about that. And you can learn more uh, about the book. But it, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. You know, now you're in Canada. I'm, I'm in the US, right? So I'm on, on the other. It's like that little Zoom line is actually the, yeah. the Canadian US border right now. So I, I appreciate you. So hey, just for people who don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself so everyone gets to know you. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get into the book. You bet. Hey, George, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on the show. It's nice to be back and uh, I always love connecting with you. So thank you. Uh, my name's Morgan Michael, as we covered, <laughs> and uh, this is my second book out. And so I'm really excited about this book because my first book was about burnout. And I think that was a really timely book after COVID and after sort of the merge lane of getting back into the classroom and being leaders and kind of managing that sense of you know, trepidation, burnout, anxiety, all those things. And so I have like a great toolbox there for helping teachers. But then as I was doing speaking, you know, into the US, in Canada, I was getting questions around how do we pull some of these strategies, some of these tips and things into the classroom. And then leaders were coming also and saying, listen, how do I how do I pull this into the morale piece? You know, how do I build a culture of belonging? And so that's where this book was born from. And so to touch back to your original question, um, my name, Morgan, comes from France, and I was actually born there. And so some of the personal experiences that I had when I was five years old, when I moved to Canada, not having learned any English at all. I came as an immigrant. My mom was French or my mom was Canadian and my dad was French. Um, but I never did learn how to speak English until I set foot in that kindergarten classroom. I literally had a pink beret on. And I remember feeling outside of for a lot of my early career in education. Mm -hmm. And so that informed the book quite a bit. And actually, as I learned English, by the time that I hit grade two, I was about eight years old. And this is really common, I've learned with a lot of immigrants or people who speak different different languages, they sort of renounce their own culture. So I stopped speaking French entirely. Mm. And I did that largely looking back because I just felt like that was the conduit for feeling outside, you know, like for mm. being outside of the culture on Gabriola Island, which was this tiny little rural island where I moved. And so full circle, though, when I graduated university as an educator, there weren't a lot of jobs in English. And, you know, Canada being dual language, uh, there were a lot of French immersion positions. And so I ended up using that thing that had initially made me feel like I was outside right. of the group. That was actually the conduit for the starting of my career. So I did that for 10 years and then switched back to English. But that's been a big part of what informed the book. And what made me feel like, okay, you know what, this is a really important topic that we need to address. You know, it's interesting you say that because, you know, my parents were immigrants from uh, Greece to Canada. Yeah. And we, and it was like interesting because we, they were in Saskatoon and it wasn't just, there's just like, there's a big Greek community there, but it was like a big Greek community from a specific village because oh, no someone way. would come over they make a little money and they'd sponsor someone from the village. So I actually go to that village and people are like, George, because <laughs> they're like all these kids that I grew up with in, uh, you know, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. But then my family moved to Humboldt because there's an opportunity to like have a Greek restaurant there. It was something unique. And I remember, it's funny you say that because I remember my parents speaking to me in Greek. I'm like, stop doing that. You're embarrassing. Yeah. Me. Right. And I hate it. And now like, one of the things I, I often challenge people with to think about is like, I wish my parents had said, no, shut up. You're learning Greek. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you yeah. don't have a choice. We don't really care what you think. So I always talk about like, there's this, we always talk about like tapping the passions and strengths of our kids, but also like exposing them to things they might not know they're interested in because probably two of my biggest regrets, uh, you know, from my childhood, it was not learning to speak Greek 
and uh, also not playing piano. Like my parents let me out of piano a little too early. And I actually started piano again this year. So like my wow. daughter's starting it. So her and I are like, and it's like bugging me because she's getting better than me. Already. <laughs> <laughs> I've been like practicing more. I'm like, how is she getting better? So yeah, I love that. Uh, yeah, but it, it's it's interesting and just kind of like her and I play like lots of stuff from all that. And so I, I, just, I love that story. I didn't know that um, about you. So one of the things that you said, I, I do have three questions uh, yeah. written down. But the, I do want to kind of ask you this outside of it. One of the things that I think I've really seen too, and I, you, you mentioned this about leadership. One of the things that really, I, I truly believe, I'm not saying principals are the most important job. I'm not saying superintendents are the most important, but there is, there's a, if they're not good, then like, it seems like no one's good. And yeah. there's a lot of times I feel that if we kind of create some of the problems that we're trying to fix. Like, yeah. it's like, Hey, we're overwhelming people, overwhelming people. And there's like something is like, yeah. Okay. Like, so we're overwhelming you. Like we're going to, but we're going to do yoga at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, how about just yeah. don't overwhelm us? Cause I don't yeah. really like yoga. So like, how are you kind of approaching that with, from that leadership perspective? Yeah. So I think, I think there, it really comes down to values. So my book goes through this build acronym. So it's around, you know, boundaries and understanding and um, integrity, really doing what you say, listening, and then also having this sense of dependability. And so really what that encapsulates is this very clear vision and connection to values. Mm -hmm. If you can really get clear as a district and then as a school, and then even more as a leader, and then for those educators under you, the paraprofessionals, all of those people to be part of the broader vision for where your district is going. That's where you don't get the same feeling of overwhelm. People mm -hmm. get overwhelmed when there's no clarity. People yeah. get overwhelmed when they don't know what the plan is. People get overwhelmed when they don't know what their role is. And so that piece around boundaries is really just about like, how do we create systems and routines and roles that are really clear. And so there are systems that enable us to be the best versions of ourselves, but then also are like boundaries that help keep us kind of on a similar path because you can go, like we've all been to those districts or you know, individual schools where there's 10 million different passion projects going on yeah. and that's fine, but I think that can be really chaotic. And then from there, people just get super overwhelmed. This is a time right now where we have so much information flying at us at all times. And so getting really, really clear on what's important comes down to minimizing and really kind of deleting anything that doesn't align with those values and that vision. And that's it. That's what I, I, read, I, think. I read this today from um, Adam Grant's book and he writes, uh, characters more than just having principles is a learned capacity to live by your principles. And I think that's yeah. like, it really, you, you sum there, summarize that really well. One of the things that I did on my staff when I was a principal, we actually had like a, a vision of what we we're trying to do. So that clarity that you're talking about, but we also wanted to give staff, um, some autonomy, but it was yeah. like, Hey, we, you are actually going to kind of say like, what are your growth areas this year? I'm not going to define that for you, but it has to push forward the vision, right? So it has mm -hmm. to be, it can't be like, it, it can't be just something that has nothing to do with what we're doing in school. So there's like, Hey, we want you to kind of find your place in this, in this, in this space that we're trying to move people forward. Um, but we're all like kind of bringing stuff together, like that, going to that one vision and mission. So really kind of focus on, I think clarity as you, as you said, but also mm -hmm. having purpose. So when you're like, and just kind of thinking about that, like where does purpose in the work that we do kind of connect with this for, you know, this idea of like burnouts and making sure that people don't feel disillusioned with kind of what we're doing in education. Cause I, I feel like I'll work harder if I see the purpose in it. And yeah. I'm not saying like everything's about working harder, but it's almost like you don't feel you're working harder if it's meaningful. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm just, Oh my gosh. No, a hundred percent makes sense. I think purpose is something that we strive for as human beings, like on an individual level. And I think that it probably starts with us. And that's why I wrote the first book is because it comes down to like, whatever you do outside of the classroom, outside of the boardroom, outside of your organization, whether you're working, you know, corporate or you're working in a school that trickles back into 
the way that you interact with people, the way that you structure your classroom, how anxious you feel, all of those things. And so I often urge, you know, and I've had principals come up to me and say, oh, I really want to start a podcast, but I, or I want to do my PhD. And I'll be like, what for? Like, what, what is the purpose behind right. that? And they're like, oh, I want to, I want to teach people, or I, I have all these things that I want to learn and I want to share that. I'm like, that's great. And what are you waiting for? And so I've had people, you know, come to me and say, like, I'm just waiting for permission or I'm waiting to finish that, that schooling. And I'm like, you know, here's the thing. You don't actually need to wait. Like you can, you can tug on that thread and you can be curious, pursue that, put one foot in front of the other. You don't necessarily know where that's going to wind up, but there's some amazing opportunities that can come out of that. And then to come back to your, your question, once you kind of get into the practice of doing that as an individual where you're feeling super passionate and you look at the world with a sense of curiosity and drive, well, that's going to come back into your practice as a yeah. leader and as an educator. And then here's the thing is you can then kind of have this ripple out culture where you are living your life this way. And when you live your life with a sense of purpose and meaning, I think that people who want or strive for that themselves kind of look and go, yeah, me too. And then suddenly you have a culture in your building, in your classroom of people who want that. Well, when you have that, you're unstoppable. Honestly, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty remarkable. There's a, I actually literally right before I got on here, um, I was talking about, I did a video about, I think it was like, I can't remember the guy's name. It's like Chris something. He's like a huge podcaster. I know Williamson? Might have been. I think it's Chris. He was with Alex Hormozzi. Oh my God. I just listened to that episode. I love it. Yeah. And they basically said something about like, people are jealous of what you have, but not jealous of what the process to, to, to get it. Yeah. And so I actually talked about that. Um, seeing that I couldn't remember his name. So now I feel bad because I'm like, Chris, <laughs> but I said the, the thing that is left out in that conversation, in that little snippet that I saw, is is actually sharing the journey of how you got to that space right and trying to bring as many people along as possible right it's like it's a really thing like oh everyone's jealous of me <laughs> like that's one thing because they're not willing to put in the work but there's a lot of people who say like hey i want to do what that person does but i don't know how they got there so like show me show me some of the stuff right and like i i always challenge people saying like hey like if you're gonna tell people that everything's wrong, everything's the worst it's ever been, but you're doing well, show them how you got there. Like show them how you got to that place. I think that's a really important thing too. I, I absolutely, I, I love that mentality. So we're, this is kind of, I actually, yeah, you kind of talked about why you wrote this book. So we're gonna, you kind of hit that. And well, I know you're gonna kind of revisit that probably in this one as well. So I, I wanted this one, what's like one practical. Okay, so there's only, there's more than one in the book. So you gotta still yeah. buy the book. Right. But uh, what's like one practical piece of advice that you, that educators you could use that you share, you know, in your writing. Okay. I'm going to cheat because every, every chapter is filled with a toolbox. One is specifically for educational leaders. So superintendents, principals, sure. the other toolbox is specifically for teachers who want to cultivate this culture of belonging in their classrooms. And there's tons. I'm going to touch on two, one for each, if that's okay. So the first one is being really, really explicit in your classroom about what it is that belonging cues are. And so really this comes down to active listening, but it's reframing that a little bit. So it's like, what signals to someone in front of you when you're having a conversation that you truly value and respect what they're saying? So for example, eye contact, appropriate, not too much, you know, and we want to be aware of like neurodivergence, but the other piece is like the, the gentle head nod, like that signals to someone you're listening, you're engaged in what they're saying and you generally really kind of agree with what they're saying that opens the door you know um being able to mirror and mimic, mimic some of their body language so if they have their hand like this going like this suddenly it creates this like subconscious level of trust and you're not going to do it on a, like a super obvious level but you can give your kindergarten students a chance to practice this as well as your 12th grade students and so being able to explicitly teach how some of these nonverbal cues can create a sense of belonging. When it comes to leaders, I often think that onboarding is something that we don't really teach leaders and, and leaders don't always consider significantly. And so how are you welcoming new students, new paraprofessionals, new educators onto your staff? And so if you haven't really thought about that much, that's something that maybe there's room for growth. So for example, you can even have your students or your staff members create like a culture video. 
this is who we are. This is what we're about. This is what we believe in. And it shows students how to like, say, walk through the classroom or walk through the hallway in an appropriate way. But it also sort of signals um, to them what's appropriate. For staff, it can be as simple as like, okay, hey, here's a tour of the school so that if your secretary is super busy or you as a principal are putting out fires, you can just send this ahead of time and say, this is where the photocopy room is. This is where the art room is. Da, da, da. Like it's sort of like a very easy way that you can front end load this system so that people are like, I know what this space looks like. I know what's expected of me. There's kind of like an accessible handbook and a video is so like, you can make that so personal. Right. And so that's just a tip that I would say is just something that people don't often do, but kind of creates a sense of cohesive culture. So he, I'll actually totally justify what he just said. I, I had, there's two districts that I worked in. Mm -hmm. One, I was there for five years. And the other one is the last one I was before I started doing this and just kind of going on, on my own. In the first one that I'm talking about, I had spent five years there. I had never met the superintendent, not one oh day, never met it. Now it was like a big geographical area and I understand that, right? So whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's it. That was in my head. That was like, it's a big geographical area. Of course, you know, it can't be here on in the, the second district where I excelled and things went really, really well for me. I met the superintendent, the entire superintendent team, all the central office staff on day one. Wow. Yeah. And it just, and I remember actually, I can still remember the man's name. I went to him and said, Hey, Hey, my name's George. I actually do all this stuff. I would love to like help you out. If I can, you know, if there's anything you can see extra for me doing here, you know, and I was like at that point where, and it was like, it was just night and day. And right. And like yeah. one place I did amazingly well, one place I felt extremely burnt out, wanted out of there, wanted to quit teaching. And I don't know if it was, it was just that, I, I don't think it was just that, but that it, there's a reflection, like that's like one of the things you could tell was not, and it was just so like, I was actually shocked that I was like, yeah. oh, that's, that's, just, that's pretty cool. And it was almost like meeting the King. Cause you had yeah. this, you had this notion that the superintendents were untouchable and they were like the wizard of Oz sitting behind some like screen running everything. And they wouldn't talk to the, you know, the peasants kind of thing. And I was just right. like, I felt that a little bit. Yeah. But then here it's like, Oh, they're just like a person that's accessible yeah. having conversations with. And it just, it, it just changed my whole viewpoint on things immediately. Yeah. So what yeah, you yeah. Just said totally. Like, and and if I, can I, can I add something? Can I add something to that too? Because I think, um, what it comes down to, too, is when we reinforce that hierarchy so significantly, I think that there's like a, an inability to be a bit vulnerable. And when we put ourselves kind of alongside other people who work for us, we are more vulnerable. You know, we do humanize ourselves a bit more. And, and I think on the flip side, that can feel a bit scary. And I think that's why it doesn't happen very often. The interesting thing about culture is that when we invite just a little bit of that appropriate vulnerability, they call it the vulnerability cycle, that people trust us more. Yeah. And so it's kind of this tension between being vulnerable enough to be accessible and visible mm -hmm. and, and there for our people so that they're like, you know what? Yeah, I'm tired, but I'm going to work really hard because I care about this district. I care what they're about um, versus kind of feeling like, well, they don't care about me, so I'm not going to yeah. care about them, right? Well, and it's interesting to me too. The other thing I, I kind of touched on this, the, the one place I said it was huge geographically, the other place was bigger. Yeah. I still met them. Right. And there's always like a perspective. Like sometimes we say, oh, we can't do this because of that. Right. So like some places I'll go, for example, in Idaho and say, Hey, we're like a huge school district. I'm like, well, how many people we have like 5,000 kids. I'm like, do you know that that's like small and some, yeah. <laughs> But their mentality is it's a huge because it's huge for here, right? So it's as opposed to seeing like, hey, you know, it doesn't matter how large your school district is. How do we actually make sure we connect with people? We go out of our way to connect. It's it's that like block. And, you know, you talk a lot about systems and cultures, but the route, we sometimes use that as like uh, an excuse to not do things. Oh, our system. Our, I'm like, the system is made up of people. It's the people yeah. make the system. Cultures make, you know, people make the culture. So, all right, last, last question. So... I as a, you know, I'm a superintendent, I'm a principal, we get this book for everybody, we all read it together. So after we read it, so what what do you hope it changes and improves like the impact? What, what do you see happening if people kind of not, not just like kind of fake read it? <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, 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 yeah. happen, but actually like read it, take the lessons, apply them. What do you see kind of the the outcome of that could be for a school or a district? Well, first, I want to say, you know, 
I'm totally guilty of fake reading books too. <laughs> right. um, but here's the thing about this book that's really nice is you can literally flip to the sections and get to the quick and dirty strategies quite nicely for discussions for, you know, PD or for meetings. So it's accessible that way, which is great. However, I think what I really want people to take away is that even through your example there, George, like you can make little microscopic changes to the way that you run your school, the classroom, your overall district. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like, we need to rip the system apart and we're building, like it can be as simple as like, yeah. maybe this year we're gonna do an onboarding video. Maybe this year I'm gonna spend a little bit more time uh, meeting with my paraprofessionals that work with me so that we can have a seamless transition. Maybe it looks like, you know, closing the recognition gap because 23% of most employees don't feel appreciated and, you know, putting a note card on, on someone's desk when I think about something that they've done for me that's, that's fantastic or whatever that's added value. And it doesn't have to be crazy, but sometimes we kind of get roadblocked or we get jammed when we think about this stuff. And it's actually really accessible. So my hope is people take one or two strategies and work it into their culture starting Monday. And then they can see a tremendous difference. Because when you think about the trajectory of like, say, an airplane, in order to end up in a completely different city or continent, an airplane really, if they're taking a pretty long journey, they're doing like a 1% shift in their trajectory, right? Either, you know, north or whatever, right? And so... I think what you have to do is really look at these changes as small incremental changes consisting of consistency over time, you know, like that's really what it's about. Well, and that's, you know, a lot of times when I do workshops or groups, they'll say like, oh, there's so much like what, like what you do. I said, just pick one thing. And if you pick yeah. one thing and you consistently do it and then you, you get really good at it and then you do another thing within a year, your, your classroom, your school could look totally different. Right. So like, but don't, if you try to do everything, you'll do nothing. But if you do one yeah. thing, everything can change. So I think that's it's like working out, right? It's like, I know you're a Absolutely. big gym guy and, and all of that. It's like, it's like just show up consistently every week, a few times a week and do the same things and do some progressive like overload and challenge yourself a little bit more each day. And the difference that you'll have in six months to a year is incredible versus if you're like setting out on day one and you want to run a marathon, like forget it. You're going to burn yourself out, get injured, all the things. I was accused of being on steroids this past week. So I was pretty happy about it. <laughs> I think that's a win, isn't it? <laughs> well, if you're not, and then you're kids, I'm like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> it was, they actually said like my ideas were on steroids, but I took it. I'm like, oh, you mean me? So uh, um, that's awesome. Yeah. Anyways. Hey, listen, everyone, Morgan, you gotta, you gotta check out the book, a blueprint for belonging. It's probably like such a, a wonderful time. Well, I don't actually, it's probably a horrible time, which is why you should read the book. <laughs> right. <laughs> if it was a wonderful time, we probably wouldn't need the book. Does yeah. that, that makes sense. I don't know a better way to say it, but I know it's a book that's really, really needed. Uh, you can check it out in the link down below. You can also connect with Morgan. You'll see uh, all of her social media on there. Thanks so much for taking the time to uh, meet with me and share the book. I hope it does really well. And I'm looking, I'm actually looking forward. We're expecting you in Florida sometime. So we'll see you. Right. So be amazing. Right. Thank you, George. Thanks for having me on. Have a wonderful day. Take care.